Hello everyone. So thanks for joining us at the Compinch conference and thanks for the organizers uh, for this good event and letting me the opportunity to uh, present my work. So my name is Igor Koval. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the RMS lab uh, in the Paris Brain Institute and today I'm going to present disease course maps and how they allow the monitoring of disease progression. So let's start by introducing what a neurodegenerative disease timelines look like. Basically, in any neurodegenerative disease timeline, there are some prodromal signs at the beginning of the disease, followed at some point by a diagnosis, and around the diagnosis, there are different symptoms that can be cognitive, motor, or neuropsychological. And such models have been described for a different disease, just as, such as Alzheimer's disease, with a well known model by Jack et al. This model is hypothetical in the sense that it gathered knowledge of uh, Jack and colleagues over the disease progression. In the same spirit, what we'd like to do is to build computational models of disease progression from clinical and imaging data that serves the following purposes. First is to summarize the disease progression and its variability within the population. Then to be able to position any individual subject on this disease timeline and to know at what disease stage he or she is. Then we'd like to determine how cofactors such as education level, genetic mutations, environmental factors, modulate this progression. Also, based on the positioning of an individual on this disease timeline, we'd like to predict the future progression of the individual. And finally, based on all the previous objectives, we'd like to determine who and when to intervene and treat the patient based on his profile. To build such model, we'll rely on longitudinal data analysis. So basically, we'll have longitudinal data of uh, numerous patients. So here's an example of a patient that came three times during his visits. Then you have a second and a third individual. The challenge here is to be able to realign the temporal dynamics of the individual data to reconstruct the long-term scenario of disease progression from the short sequences of individual data. This means to be able to realign them during the long-term scenario of disease progression. Then, based on that, we'd like to disentangle the individual characteristics from the average progression to be able to go from the mean trajectory to an individual one and be able to compare all the individual trajectories. And finally, if we're able to disentangle the measurement values from the measurement dynamics, we will be able to predict future disease stages as such. By leveraging all the previous challenges I've just exposed, we've been able to develop a new tool that we call the disease course map, which is basically an atlas of the disease progression. The underlying intuition of this model is to be able to take longitudinal data of many subjects. So here is an example of three subjects, subject A, subject B, and subject C that we've seen a repeated number of times, so the subject A has been seen four times, and at each visit we've recorded two different biomarkers. So here in blue is the evolution of the second biomarker, the blue biomarker, over three repeated visits. Based on that, the model we're using is able to recombine this individual data into a long-term history of the disease that shows the progression over a long period of time of each biomarker. Here, a natural question arises. How do we go from the individual data to their repositioning on the mean timeline? So to explain that, we need to introduce three parameters that allows this individual repositioning. The first parameter is the time shift. It allows to delay or to onset the, the visits of the individual from their real age to their reparameterized time on the disease stage axis. The second parameter allows to inform about how fast or how slow the disease progress at the individual level compared to the mean progression. So an acceleration factor higher than one would mean that the individual go faster than the average, whereas an acceleration factor lower than one means that the disease progress at a slow pace. Finally, the last individual parameter, the intermaker spacing omega, 
informs about the fact that the sequence of events that appear along the disease progression at the individual level may differ from one individual to the other. Meaning that maybe for some individual, the blue biomarker will arise way earlier than the orange one, whereas for other persons, this might be inverted. And so this parameter delays each biomarker from its mean representation to the individual data. At this presentation is more result oriented than methodological oriented, we just like to say a few words about the estimation procedure. In the algorithm, we estimate simultaneously the population parameters that are basically the shape and position of the logistic curves of the mean trajectory here and here. And on the other hand, we also estimate the individual parameters, which are alpha, the isolation factor, tau, the time shift, and the omega, which is the inter-marker spacing. And so if you want more details about this nonlinear mixed effect model, which is estimated by stochastic approximation of the EM algorithm, we point out few references. Now let's use this method to build the Huntington disease course map. We've selected patients from the track AHD cohort. From this cohort, some patients were included in the following track on cohort, as well as new presymptomatic mutation carriers. For all these patients, we've selected three clinical biomarkers, four cognitive biomarkers, as well as eight imaging biomarkers that were all normalized to the total intracranial We normalized all the previous data between a value of zero, meaning a normal value, to a value of one, corresponding to an abnormal value. And this is what the model outputs. It is basically the progression from 20 years old to 80 years old of all the features. Prior to go any further in the interpretation of the previous results, let's look at how we can compare the different biomarkers and their progression. Here what I'm showing is the distribution of the normalized value of a biomarker 1 for control patients here in green and of uh, HD patient in uh, red. On the other hand, this is the, dis the distribution of another biomarker also for control patient and HD patient. The threshold I've added here are the 95th percentile of the data for the control patients. And what we see is that based on the biomarker distribution, the threshold can appear at different biomarker value. This threshold in the following will be called the pathological threshold. And if we represent this pathological threshold on the previous presentation of the progression of our biomarkers, for each biomarker, we're able to know at which age the average progression crosses this pathological threshold. And if we repeat the estimation of each of the biomarkers a given number of time, we can represent for each biomarker at which age it's getting abnormal. So here is the representation of all the previous HD variables and the age at which each of them becomes abnormal. So for instance, the total motor score becomes abnormal at an age of around 38, 35 years old followed by imaging features as the striatum, the putamus, the globus pallidus, and the caudate. Then, you have a lot of different variables, and the last one to convert to a normal value is the gray matter at the rate age of around 65 to 70 years old. We then build the same course map for Parkinson's disease. We've selected patients from the PPMI cohort, also as the DPD cohort, and we've selected 10 different biomarkers. So first, six clinical biomarkers, among which the MDS, PDRS, and other cognitive scores, as well as four imaging biomarkers. So here is the estimated Parkinson's disease course map, where on the top panel, you see the progression of each feature, as well as each pathological threshold. And on the bottom line, it's the representation of the ages when each feature becomes normal, starting by the putamen right and left, then the MDS3 score and other imaging variables from the code 8 right and left, and followed by other cognitive measurements. To finish, we've also built the Alzheimer's disease course map for data coming from neuropsychological assessments, 
such as the attack at ASCOG and the MMC, but also imaging data. This imaging data are, on the one hand, the FDG pad, and on the other hand, two data extracted from MRI data, which are the cortical thickness map and the hippocampal atrophy. And on the bottom part of the screen, you see some demographics of the individuals. The results of the Alzheimer's disease course map are visible on the Digital Brain website when we are showing a description of the disease progression for the four previous modalities and how they evolve through time for a period from 60 years old to 90 years old. And what you can see is here the shrinkage of the cortical thickness, here uh, the diminution of the volume of the hippocampus, left and right, here is the FDG pet, and you see the glucose consumption getting smaller over time, and here is the progression of the four biomarkers. And you can definitely visit this website to play around with all the different features. Once we've built the disease course map at the group average level, let's see how we are able to personalize this map to any individual data to position the subject's progression on a personalized trajectory. If you remember well, we were able to position the individual data back on the, indi on the group average timeline of the disease progression thanks to three parameters, which are the acceleration factor alpha, the time shift tau, and the intermarker spacing omega. We can look at the distribution of those parameters within a given population. So here is an example of the distribution of the acceleration factor and the time shift where each dot represents one individual. And we can do the exact same representation but for the interim marker spacing. So now let's apply this ID to the patient from track HD and track on cohort. So a reminder is that some patients here in blue are both present in the track HD and then followed up in the track on cohort. And if you represent the acceleration factor and the time shift of this three cohort, this is what we see. And basically, what is interesting is that the patient here are the patient with the high acceleration factor, which means they are fast progressor. And those patients in track HD, fast progressors, are not present anymore in the track on cohort. Otherwise, they would be in the blue cohort. Does that mean that fast progressors were not followed up in later stages? Similarly, the late converters here with a high time shift are present both in a track HG and track on cohort, meaning that patients whose disease onset were at late ages were both present in both cohorts. The interpretation of such graph is that patients that were too fast progressor were not being able to be followed up in the track on cohort, whereas patients with a late onset were able to be followed up in the track on cohort. And if we look not at the characteristic of each patient independently of their disease stage, but if we look at their disease stage at the time they were included or followed up in the different cohorts, this is what we see. So in orange here is the disease stage of the visits within the track HD cohort, whereas in green here is the disease stages of the visits in the track on cohort. Basically what it shows is that patients that were included at late disease stages from 50 to 80 years old within the track HD cohort were not present in the track on cohort. Otherwise, they would be in the blue histogram. We then represent the individual parameters of patients from the PPMI cohort, tracking Parkinson's disease. Here, we differentiate the patients based on their rapid eye movement, which informs about sleep behavior disorder. Without further interpretation, we see from the different distribution that different RBD implies different individual parameters and thus different disease progressions. Finally, same results were computed for the Alzheimer's disease course map when we looked at how the gender and the APOE E4 mutation affects the speed factor, so the extraction factor, the time shift, and also the intermarker spacing here, depending on the modality we're looking at. So how to read that? Here it indicates that 
female goes 1.27 times faster than male in the thickening of the left hemisphere, of the hippocampus of the left hemisphere. And also, the thickening starts 33.6 months earlier for female than male. Here, it shows that the cognitive decline is 1.46 times faster for female than male, and it starts 36.8 months earlier. Now that we've seen that we were able to analyze how different cofactors affect the disease progression at the individual level, let's see from there how to predict the future subject's progression based on the disease course map. We've shown that the model allows us to use the individual data to reposition them in order to compute the group average trajectory. But the model also allows us, with the same parameter, to go back from the group average trajectory to the individual data. And based on seeing baseline visits, we're able to predict the future disease stages and biomarker values of the individual. And by doing so, and by hiding the visit in a cross-validation setting, we're able to predict how the subject's biomarker will change in a few years. So here is a representation of the error of prediction and the mean absolute error of prediction of three biomarkers being the SDMT, the Stroop and the TMS at four different times within a one year prediction, two years ahead prediction, three year and four years. And what we see as for the mean absolute error is that it's almost always under a 5% error, absolute error. And this has to be compared to the natural variability of each of these score, which is usually around 5%. We've also done a similar setting of prediction for Alzheimer's disease course map, where we used data from ADNI to calibrate the model and predict future biomarkers in a cross-validation setting. But to be even more robust and to see how it replicates, we've used four different cohorts to do the prediction, where the calibration of the model has been done only on the ADNI data. And the results has been compared to the constant prediction to the linear mixed effect model and also within the scope of the International Tadpole Challenge. But more importantly, we've looked at how different parameters, such as the number of subset of known visits or the time to prediction or other cofactors, affect the quality of the prediction. And here I'm teasing you as all the results will be discussed by Etienne Mao tomorrow uh, at the session from 10.30 to 11. And it's called the forecast of the MMSC and ADAS scores up to six years ahead with cross cohort replication. Based on all the previous features, let's look at how this course map can help us to identify the right patient at the right time to intervene, essentially in clinical trials. Let's look at what clinical trials try to do. Based on a pool of subjects, here is the initial cohort, clinical trials try to target a subset of patients. Inclusion criteria are designed to include as many targeted subjects as possible. Nonetheless, these criterions are not optimal. Therefore, we use the ability of our model to predict future biomarkers value to better target the patients. It resulted on 50% less patients included in the cohort, with targeted patients growing from 26% of the included patients up to 40%. We then design a trial simulation to see how our selection of the patients affect the number of needed subjects. So for a trial simulation of a drug improving the total motor score by 15% in two years, where the standard criteria would require 256 patients, our method with selection technique would require 138 patients, which is 46 fewer patients. So to sum up, disease course mapping is a novel statistical technique which allows one to first summarize the range of possible disease progression profile, then to explain how different factors modulate the disease progression. Then we've been able to position new subjects onto this map and predict the future evolution of their biomarkers. And finally, it allows, especially in clinical trials, to select the right patient at the right disease stage. So for this work, I'd like to thank all the different collaborators and partners, especially Stanley Jolleman, which is the head of the ARMIS team, but also other doc students and engineers, as well as clinical collaborators on Huntington's, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease.
Finally, if you want to read out more about the, this technique and the different applications we've been proposing, you can check the open source software called Lispy on GitLab, but also the different uh, publications. Thank you.